we're talking that people have to recognize this disease. And this is a big, big disease, bigger than I think many physicians uh, know. Then what are the signs and the symptoms of this disease? How does it present? Uh, macula damage is a big thing. It is. I think that one of the earliest symptoms that people will notice is simply light, dark disassociation. In what other words, mean? it means if you go from a bright area outside, a bright lit room, into a darker room, for example, the classic example is going into a restaurant. Patients just won't be able to adapt to darker settings as quickly as others. That's the most common symptom if you look across all types of AMD. That mostly represents the early, mild, or intermediate forms of dry AMD. But then when you get into significant visual acuity loss, you're talking about either bleeding in the back of the eye, which is wet macular degeneration, or geographic atrophy, which is death of the central macula. So Both the wet, of those the wet refers to loss. blood, really? It really does. Wet, neovascular, they're really the same phrase talking about the growth of abnormal blood vessels distorting and destroying the central retina. And in terms of presentation, wet AMD versus dry AMD, how do they differ? It's confusing. It's worth taking just a moment to describe this. So everybody with macular degeneration has dry macular degeneration, right? That's sort of a baseline, mild or intermediate form. And then if you develop the advanced form, you either develop wet macular degeneration with bleeding or advanced dry. It's unfortunate that the early and the advanced forms can both be called dry, but advanced dry macular degeneration is also called geographic atrophy. And the, the speed with which this can progress, what do we know about that? Well, it is a degenerative disease, and, and for most people, the course of macular degeneration is very slow. But once somebody is to develop wet macular degeneration, the onset can be quite rapid. And from the onset of symptoms that a patient might notice, they can lose vision permanently in just a matter of days. Days? Yeah. Days? Yeah. Okay, so if you've only got some days to work with this, it's incumbent mm -hmm. upon everybody to know what they're dealing with, right? So where, where's the, the trigger point? How do we need to manage this? Well, I think when a person has, they begin to recognize they have something wrong with their center vision, that needs to be evaluated. And uh, there's a great public awareness campaign that's out there to, to bring more of this important finding to light so that patients can report it to their physicians. Oftentimes, Charlie and I will see people who have presented to our office and say, well, when did this start? Well, uh, three or four months ago, I, I noticed I wasn't seeing very well. I, I just thought it would go away. And then, unfortunately, we see them a little later than we would like to, where we could intervene more effectively. Okay, but, but patient, I'm sorry, people, you seem like you want to well, say something. I was just going to say, so, so gentlemen, is there anything that can be done on the prevention side? Because it seems that the, by the time somebody is developing these, this, this uh, sense of lost vision, mm -hmm. was there a, an earlier opportunity that we missed, uh, either on the, on the managed care side or on the clinical side, or what, what well, can we do? Well, following recommendations of regular eye exams to screen for this disease are really important. So, you know, after somebody is the age of 55 or has a high RAS risk factor, then they need to go and have a dilated eye exam uh, to take a look. And uh, they also need to be aware of what's happening in their family members because this is a genetic disease for most individuals. And you say risk factors. Let, let's lay them out. What are the risk factors? So, uh, you know, family, family uh, history is certainly one of the big ones. Uh, smoking history is a big one. And age. Uh, age is the biggest one. So I think those really encapsulate the major risk factors for this disease. Uh, another important thing, you know, just to address what can be done is there's been very good studies conducted by the National Eye Institute which show that using an AREDS vitamin supplement can delay the progression to advanced AMD. And so patients that meet the criteria for taking these supplements should be on them. And that's another thing that the primary care can really help out with is to making sure that patients that have this disease are indeed taking the supplements. And the, these supplements are over the counter? Do they have to be prescribed? What do you get? They're over the counter, correct. Yeah. Okay. And uh, sometimes that's a, that's a difficult cost burden for people who are often on a fixed income um, because now in addition to their regular medicines, they'll be taking a vitamin supplement, which is important uh, for them to take to decrease the risk of developing I, vision loss. I agree. It's critical to distinguish what the modifiable from the non-modifiable risk factors are. So smoking, don't smoke, heart health, keep all your cardiovascular risk factors well controlled, and then the vitamins. But the vitamin issue, there are some caveats. So the challenge is not all people at risk of AMD should be on the vitamins. It's a relatively small population okay. of our entire global population who should be on the vitamins. So don't put everybody on vitamins just because they're at the age where they could have macular degeneration. You gotta get the dilated eye exam. I completely agree with Jared. Every year, all adults over 50 should at least get one exam a year.